everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for that second session where we're going to have a, de a demo on, of the uh, Spine Toolbox. Um, since uh, uh, most of the people or all of the people that are joining us today were here the, on the first uh, session on Tuesday, I will go a bit uh, quicker on my introduction uh, uh, words. Um, for the housekeeping rules, uh, well, we're going to keep it uh, uh, under an hour again today. Uh, it will be recorded. Uh, it will be made available after the um, in the coming uh, let's say to, tonight or tomorrow. The, for your information, the recording of the first uh, webinar is is now uh, available on the website. Uh, I do pr uh, propose that for this uh, this demo session we proceed uh, a bit differently. If you do have a question that would be better answered right now during the demo, uh, I do invite you to uh, raise your hand and. Um, and ask it. If you don't have any questions, please keep your microphone on mute. Uh, we're still going to have some time for a Q&A session at the end, so if there is a question that is more of general, uh, broader scope or broader interest, or not directly linked to a, a particular element in the demo, please use the, you can use the chat box to type it in or ask it at the, uh, during the, uh, the Q&A session. Uh, I will go quick on that. Uh, again, because you were all there, I invite you to go on the website to uh, read some of the report we have pr we produced on the first year, mainly the one that present the um, uh, the proposal for a uh, energy modeling center for Canada. Um, uh, this is still uh, all all available there. Um, for the um, so today again, it's uh, Mr. Yuha Kiviluoma that will give the uh, the demo. Um, I won't repeat its bio. I would only insist on two things that he has been developing some, he's been involved in the development of model modeling tools, um, various models. And he's also worked at, uh, he gained experience at the leading projects and also managing big work packages, which is probably why he's, um, he's a, a, which maybe is one of the reasons he's, he's um, he started developing uh, uh, this, uh, the spine toolbox. So, uh, I will stop sharing my screen and I will uh, give you, uh, you have the, uh, the control over the, uh, the screen for the demo. Thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe I should remember to stress that while I maybe have been parcel responsible for the work here, there is a lot of people uh, involved in the project and, and uh, a lot of really good uh, coders and modelers that, that have been working with this to get this where we are now. So all the, all the respect to those people. Um, so I hope you can see the screen and um, here is the, just to point out that there is this address, github.com, uh, spine project, spine toolbox, where is our, a mirror of our repository. We are still working in, uh, in actually our own GitLab uh, kind of private repository, where for now our all the issues and all the kind of the discussions are happening here. We are right now in the process of moving all stuff to the public uh, GitHub site. So all the code has been public uh, for a long time, but we've just kept our discussions until now. Uh, to ourselves, but it will all be coming here in, in near future in a couple of weeks. And uh, so it's a Git, uh, maybe many of you know that. If you don't, there is lots of material in the internet to find out what it's about. It's a version control system that you can uh, use to make sure that uh, people contributing to the code can do it in an efficient way together. And, and then it also means that you can pull all the code from here and, and install it in your computer. So there is uh, instructions how to do that installing and so forth. There is also, um, if you scroll down, there is also release versions available so that you can just install it. They are running late uh, in comparison to what's in the, in the repository where you actually need to install Python and stuff like that to, to be able to run it. But I really recommend using the, the repository and not the installation files if you're really serious about using it. Uh, since at least for now, uh, it's going to be more advanced what you get from the repository. Um, so um, 
then another other place I will be using um, there is this uh, spine project has other components to it. Um, uh, there is a spine opt, which is an energy systems model. Some might be interested in, but but what I'm going to show today is actually this um, demo. So there is another repository you can also pull with the version control software, and and or even just take, you can also clone it from here. Oops. Uh, I think you can just download it as a chip as well and put it on your or on your hard drive somewhere and then it will be a folder for a project that I, I'm going to be showing and it should work if you just download it and open this uh, folder from Spine Toolbox and you, you should get everything that I'm sure I'm going to be showing today uh, on your own machine as well. So. Uh, with that said, I can then go to the actual toolbox. And, and as, as Louis was saying, please interrupt me. This is uh, important that uh, I give a good picture of what's actually happening and I might be missing things because I'm too used to stuff. So please interrupt me and ask questions when needed. Um, I saw something like this already Tuesday, but this is a bit more uh, constrained. Um, I'm not having a lot of stuff on the importing data side. It's just this, uh, because this is a very small test system uh, to show what we can do here in, with this system. So I'm starting from the data sources here um, and uh, it's pointing to an Excel file. So I can double click it and I can see it in the Excel. So opening it. Um, so it's a very small Excel file with uh, uh, three sheets, three notes, uh, having a time series of uh, electricity demand for two nodes. It has another sheet where there is a three plants capacity uh, operating cost uh, a ramp limit for one of the plants. And then uh, it has a relationship saying that these two plants are in the node one and the, and the third plant is in node two. So very simple Excel file. Um, and I would assume that a lot of the data that's coming into the modeling uh, is, it can be Excel files, it can be other, other kinds of sources, um, but often, you probably do some pre-processing before it starts to look like something that um, uh, can be imported uh, to the database uh, you would be using for actual modeling purposes. So you can build part of that um, processing here as, as part of the workflow, or you can have, maybe it might be even better to have a separate project for, for major parts of that chain where, where you are processing the input data. You could put Python scripts there and, and the Jupyter console and uh, stuff like that, as I was explaining on, on Tuesday. Um, but I'm just doing this very simple now. So I had this uh, original data file. Then uh, the next step is to map the file so that I can import it into this database. So I'm going to show you the mapper. Um, and this could be other files besides Excel, uh, CSV, uh, GDX, JSON are currently supported. And we've tried to build it in a modular fashion so that people can also build uh, support to other file types. And, and we might even manage to do some of that before the project is over but and, and in the future as well as, as need be. But uh, but those are there at the moment. And so I'm showing this that I have, I have, a, I have that Excel file now here um, and, and it's opened the sheets and I can see the sheets, what they contain. And I've, I've already done this work before. So you're just seeing the kind of the end result of that. But I could um, make a little bit of uh, edits here so that, uh, uh, 
uh, I can kind of redo it so that you will see a bit better what's happening. So this is a, um, I'm emptying these so that uh, I can I can redo the stuff. Um, at the moment, I I have this sheet, grid nodes and Excel sheet. I'm gonna import it to a database and I need to be trans giving the database the information it needs. One of the things is that uh, I'm bringing data and that data needs to be put into some class of entities. And I have given that class name here, a grid node. I could also just pick it from the table names. So if I would take a table name, it would be grid nodes because that's what the sheet says in, in Excel. But I actually want to have it as a grid node because that's what I want to call it in my database where I'm managing my data. So then the next thing here is to um, tell the importer where the, um, the names of the objects come from. And they are here in the row two, the node names. So I'm gonna go here and, and take a row and, and take the second row. So I made a mapping that the object names are gonna be on this row. Um, so another thing I've, uh, I have here is that the values, I could also have that there are no values. I'm gonna show an example on the, on the last one about that, but uh, I, I, I have values and, and then I have actually selected also that it's, a, it's not a single value, but it's a map. Uh, there are multiple values uh, for each object. Each demand is actually an array of numbers. And it's, it's a map because there is a key it's not just a simple array where you would just have a numbers and no keys for the numbers. We have the keys, we have those T0001 and so forth. So it's, it's a map here. And um, I have also just indicated that this whole sheet is about, is about a single parameter elect demand, uh, giving it a constant name. And then, then the thing I need to new, do next is to give where this index is for the map. And it's here on the columns, second column. So I'm gonna choose column here and then take the second column. And now I have actually done the mapping again uh, for, the, for the sheet. There could also be metadata that I would map. And also if there would be alternatives uh, available, but we, I'm not going to explain that now. We have a bit more about that in the database side. So this is just an example how to map data that's coming into the system. And it will, of course, now remember this mapping that, that I have done. And I could also, whenever the data changes in the original data file, I can re-import it. It should work fine if there is more columns here more nodes or more rows, it should all work uh, fine uh, when I re-import things using this system. And of course, the idea is that you do this work uh, once and, and of course, every time the data structure changes, but if it doesn't change, you can just uh, take the data back into the system uh, when you need to do that, when there is an update into the underlying original data tables uh, or whatever is the source of the original data. Um, then the other table is a bit similar, but there's just, um, instead of having those objects on this, on this second row, it happens to have the, um, uh, the parameters. So every entity, uh, can have multiple parameters and, and those parameters can then have these values. So we have the objects on the column and the parameters for the objects on the row and the values in the uh, pivoted table uh, in the Excel. And it's been mapped again. And then the, there is final sheet here that doesn't have any number values. It's only about relationships between uh, two object classes. So the, the nodes and 
plants are being mapped where where they are and we are letting the importing system to know how to uh, how to establish the relationship so now everything is set um, I can then just run this one I forgot to rerun so it might take a little while before it gets everything started I'm getting an error. Ah, oh, I should have checked what I was doing. Reference grid node could not be found in header. Oh, oh it, uh, I pressed the totally wrong button now, sorry. <laughs> uh. close the whole window so restart the uh, toolbox so what did I do wrong there was that I had a when I was showing you stuff here um, I forgot to change. I, I think I left here table name and then rewrote it. I should have had here that constant grid node. All right now it's working so i i did get the data here i had it already before so i'm gonna try to show you one aspect we we've, we've built here um, this is the view on the whole database and um, you can see that the, there is this uh, um, uh, demand data we brought it's just a map but i can double click it and you can see the actual numbers underneath there so it's um we don't when whenever there is a long array data time series or such things it might this this whole thing would be very unresponsive if we would have those lots of data available all the time for the user so we've we've uh, tried to build this so that uh, it remains Unvisible and fast, uh, as long as you don't actually want to go there and see what's there. But you can always go there and see what's there uh, when you need need to do that. Uh, but then in the power plant side, where it was not array data, it was just uh, simple numbers. Then you can right away see that here. So I'm having a um, uh, this uh, view that's a pivot table. I can also expand this. Um, oops, I pressed something wrong. So I can also expand it so that I can actually see the numbers also in this table. But this wasn't actually yet what I was wanting to show. Um, I've now selected alternative uh, of data called import data. So this is what I just imported here into the database. I've taken it before and I've renamed that base so the data is there actually now twice because uh, it's the same data but it's it's there twice I could actually bring this one here as well and then uh, then you can see that the data is there actually twice and the nice thing about this is that when you import stuff to this system you're not overriding something that you might not want to overwrite uh, you you uh, will need to make a conscious decision that you are actually uh, deleting maybe the old data set and replacing it with the new one so but in this case i'm just going to delete the uh, the just imported data and it's gone 
uh, actually you can i can i can still undo that uh, but uh, uh, i should what i should really do is to uh, just uh, leave it like this because we're going to be uh, running with one data set only so it's there again but i'm going to remove it now and then I'm going to make a commit to the database uh, removed. And now it's gone. Um, so that was the first view on the data side. Um, we're going to have a bit of more of that when we get to the results. Uh, just that was just demonstrating um, uh after the import or actually i still want to show you something because <laughs> um here i can also take this um alternative here um and uh, maybe i'm gonna put that one there so you can see that i i'm using this alternative concept in the database so that i have a base case which has all the values and then I have a high cost case where the plant A has a higher operating cost. And I've just, I mean, I imported only the base data basically. And then I've done this high cost scenario here in the database uh, separately. I could, for instance, now also have a, a higher cost for plant B if I, if I want to do that. Uh, let's do that, why not? Uh, and then it means that I have two alternative sets of values, the base set and the high cost set. And then I can use these to define scenarios. I have a base scenario, uh, which has only the base alternative. And then I have the high cost scenario, which has first the base values, but then also the high cost values. And it means that when it's querying the database in the in the next step, uh, when you want to choose the high cost scenario, then it will uh, take the values for base, but replace them with the high cost values when the high cost values are available. And you can build a, a, a stack of these changes. So it allows you to work uh, with scenarios in a quite nice way. And I was also on Tuesday talking about that we want to expand this to have a system of recipes where you can do set operations on, on these alternatives. Um, yeah, maybe that, that was what I was gonna still show here. And, and now the scenarios are visible here in the arrow. I selected this arrow from, from the database towards the model and what's happening there is that um, I have a, I can choose what uh, scenarios I can actually send to this track going forward. And I have here three different versions of uh, models. Uh, there is a Julia model, there is a GAMS model, and then there is an alternative Julia model. The point of the, the Julia model and the alternative Julia model in terms of the model itself, they are the same, but I'm just demonstrating two different ways of managing the data coming from the database. So in this first case, in this middle one, what happens is that I have a, a filter that's something that Spine Toolbox itself supports. So if I press this uh, uh, edit button here, I can see what uh, parameters there are in the database. There is that elect demand, but I want to rename it to be demand because this Julia model uses demand and not elect demand. And then there is net capacity turns into capacity and operating cost to OP cost. Um, and in the next step, uh, I'm also changing the set names. Uh, so the crit node becomes node, crit node, uh, power plant relationship becomes uh, node unit relationship and the power plants become units. Um, and then I can, I can then have um, 
the Julia model to get stuff with the names it wants while the database here has names that uh, the user uses when they are working with the common data set that can serve multiple different models. And, and the same is here with GAMS, but there is a further step because while the Julia can directly read the database, uh, GAMS can't. So there is an exporter here that knows uh, that where I'm gonna uh, just uh, take that uh, node and, uh, and, and whatever I want to actually export to the GAMS model, I'm, I'm selecting that here and then doing some other operations. Other operations like saying, is it still working? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Just sounds so quiet. There is a subtle uh, noise in the background typically, but it goes away whenever the Bluetooth uh, <laughs> shuts off. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, this is just giving an indexing uh, uh, for the, what this T uh, dimension, whether the T0001s zero, zero, zero are, what it should be called in the, when it goes to GAMS. And it, it's because GAMS has certain way of handling stuff that's a bit different than we have handling stuff in the, in the spine toolbox. So stuff like that needs to be happening before we can send it to the GAMS model. And it actually just uh, uh, stores a GDX file that the GAMS model reads and then the GAMS outputs a GDX file. And again, we take that output results and we make a very similar mapping for the results as we just did it for the Excel input file. And it goes to the uh, result database then. And, and then what's different here with the other track for Julia is that instead of using the inbuilt uh, functions for changing parameter and set names, uh, it's using a Python script. So there is a, uh, underneath, I can uh, edit the main program file. It's a Python file that does basically the same thing as these two uh, icons, items here, but it's our self-made system. And, and uh, as I was saying before, it's a, um, if you really want to do something more fancy that we, uh, you can do by the more easy to use ways in, in, the, um, in the toolbox system, you can, do anything in the Python side. Uh, so it's a bit slow to open this PyCharm, but uh, basically I just opened the Python code that uh, calls the database uh, and uh, takes also this uh, other, the CSV file that's just saying how to map the names as a input information as well. And, and it runs the uh, Python script to output uh, the, uh, the data, but with new names to another database that then confirms with the names that the Julia model needs. And then it will be sent to the uh, other instance of the same Julia model to be comp computed. Maybe what you can see here is that, um, I have this uh, icon here and you can see that it has available resources. One of the available resources is this uh, input file. Uh, another one is the input database and then there is the output database here as well. They are all here listed as available resources. The Python script requires arguments and I can just drag these here as arguments and, and, and put them in the order that they need. That the, Python script needs. And then it kind of merges the, uh, the Python code with the workflow you see here through those uh, tool arguments or script arguments in this case. 
Um, so I might just uh, run this. I'm gonna just open the result database first to see that if it's empty. Yeah, it's all empty. I've, I've emptied before. So I can just run run the whole, I mean, let's choose the, I'm gonna choose these here and run them. And what happens now is that I have um, two scenarios here, two scenarios here, and two scenarios here. It's gonna be running all of them in parallel. Uh, and uh, we, we will see which one is fastest. I suppose the Julia will be slow because it's starting up the whole Julia system. Uh, and it's starting up four instances of Julia. And that will take a bit of uh, time and resources because Julia is something where it um, it runs, I don't, there is a name for it, but it it runs everything, but if you change, and it keeps it in memory, um, but if you change something, a code, it will change that part of the code again and run and compile it and then run again. So it's kind of a uh, compiling on the run to some extent, and now it's saying a problem, whoops. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that what it says now. I there is a because it's running six different instances. The GAM side is now ready, but I can check this. Um, I I have this Julia model selected, and I can I can take the it's executing it in two threads. This particular Julia model. One is for the high cost and one is for the base. And I can see what's happened. It's failed on both occasions. Um, and it's saying that trying to start the Julia kernel and, and it's failing with that. Um, I can see that the Julia has started to some extent. So I'm a bit surprised why it's uh, complaining. Uh, I, I did the classic mistake that I didn't test it right before showing this to you. And I know there were, and I pulled the latest changes from our repository and sometimes things break. And it could be that it, they just broke. <laughs> Uh, or then it might be just some problem starting up Julia, but now that the Julia is running, it's at least going a bit further. It's saying here, it's trying to include the Julia model. Um, so let's let's see if it actually would work. While it's doing that, uh, I, I, uh, it's actually executing in Spine Engine. So this, this whole toolbox system is, uh, I can still use this fine. Nothing is uh, unresponsive because it's calculating. It's not calculating with this one, it's calculating with the spine engine in the background. Um, I should also be able to see the results. Uh, so I'm gonna just refresh, because the GAM side did run I should be able to see those results. So I, I can, what I can see here is uh, GAMS results. So I could maybe rename this so that it's not so horribly long. It has to be base GAMS and uh, this one can be high cost GAMS. And then uh, we can have a bit of a view on the results. Maybe first to show a more simple view of the, of the results. So uh, I should have all the alternatives selected. And uh, you can see that the base scenario had a lower cost than the high cost scenario as would, what one would expect. And I can also see that there is a um, 
prices for both nodes for both scenarios. Um, so this is a, a list view where everything is in rows. So I'm gonna just go back to that uh, pivot table view where I can order stuff a bit nicer. I'm just wondering why it's now it's giving me the stuff here. So uh, I see these two nodes. I see the two alternatives. I'm going to drag them here. Um, I'm going to put the node up there and the parameter can go there. So I have this and I can, I can maybe even plot, plot that now. Uh, not such a nice plot, but, but at least you can quickly see what's happening there. I can also do that index expansion so that I, um, I can see the, oh, I should probably put that one here and the nodes there. Sorry to interrupt. I think your audio cut out. I think you weren't hearing me for a while or. Maybe the last 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, I, I just kept brought the objective values here, the total system cost of the of the runs, and we can compare them and then we can see that the, um, there is a higher values in the GAMS and then in the Julia side. And, uh, and then of course, uh, this is one of the main things we want to achieve with this toolbox is that you can actually run multiple models that are trying to do the same thing uh, but they probably have some differences how they've been actually built and you can start to see whether there are problems in, in one of them or in both of them just by comparing what they produce. And here we can see that the GAMS model is producing higher costs than the Julia model. And, I, and of course, with this simple example, I happen to know what's the reason. <laughs> uh, and, and the reason is that the GAMS model has the ramp constraints, but the Julia model doesn't have them. And that's the result of, of the differences in the, in the results. Um, yeah. So maybe that's just, the, I don't know, we could, I don't think there's so much interesting more in the result side, but, but I guess that's the, that's the kind of the workflow system and, and the demonstration of that, uh, that comes to my mind right away, but I would be very happy if there's some questions. And maybe I remember something soon, but <laughs> that's nothing right now. Well, thank you. you have, uh, well, I, I do have a question, but um, do you have any examples where you had to make some, 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 uh, scripting or, or tools to uh, at the, uh, the data import stage let's say that when you you're missing some data in 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 the um, time series or you have to convert your data is there an example you can show us of that i don't have it on my machine right now i know there um the uh, ucd uh, one of the partners in the project has been doing that kind of a missing values. Uh, 
uh, script, but I don't have the version where you can run it through the toolbox at the moment. So uh, it probably takes a bit more time than than uh, than is available here to get it working. So. And are those uh, scripts available if, and, and the, uh, the GitHub? I'm not the GitHub archive? sure whether that one is there. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, what we have here, for instance, on the input data side, um, and, and oh, yeah, especially because this is the public one, there is a bit more here in our private one. Um, so I know that there is. Um, this is not so interesting for you, but uh, maybe just as an example, there is a, this uh, yes, uh, kind of a system that can take stuff from the NSOE and, and turn it into something that Toolbox can manage. Uh, I don't have this one either set up on my system. Uh, and as you can see, this doesn't have any <laughs> instructions, so I'm not going to try it right away now. But uh, but that would be another example uh, that I can't show you. But it's and we should actually push it here that it would be also available on this public side. But, uh, and then there is yeah, we have a uh, just that you can get uh, reanalysis data downloaded. Uh, uh, from I think it's from NASA's uh, Merra sets, and and it gives a bit easier access to that data through this. But again, I don't, I haven't been trying it myself, and so I don't have it working on my machine. Okay, thank you. Well, but I do have on my machine. And of course, I'm a bit scared to be <laughs> trying it out, but I, especially because I broke stuff a little while ago. We do um, have a question here that can be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, any additional inf uh, documentation of the Python library associated with Spine? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So if you go to that Spine toolbox um, uh, repository, uh, there is a, a this badge that we have do documentation, and I always go through here. I guess there are other ways to go there, but there is uh, there is a documentation. Um, it's a kind of a more that how to use. There isn't that much on the actual code itself, uh, but but there is a stuff here that, uh, that can be helpful when you are trying stuff to get stuff working. Um, it might not be all up to date in all parts, but I think it's a good start anyway. There is even getting started. Uh, always whether they are, how up to date they are. It's, it's a tricky thing with this, uh, Software, especially when it's still moving rather fast, then things tend to get uh, left behind in the documentation site rather easily. Yeah, always hard to keep doc, uh, documentation updated. Yeah, right? up to date. One more question on the last talk you spoke spoke on creating a database through Spine that others could also use for their own models. Mm. Could you speak on how that would work? Yeah, so maybe I go back here. I... Well, I already switched that uh, project, but I'm going to reopen that um, project. So I would just that this, I mean, assuming that there is lots of actual real good data coming in, people have been working on it, creating the data and making sure everything is fine. And then it ends up here in the master data set. Uh, right now, this is an SQLite file, uh, but when you, oops, I don't want to overwrite that. I'm just going to drag a new database here. Uh, let's call it remote. So I can, instead of doing a local SQLite, I can do a MySQL file and, and set up, uh, if I have a server for MySQL, I can connect to that server and create a database in that server. 
And then of course, others should also be able to connect to that same database sitting on the server. And we were just testing this, that this is now hopefully working. Um, uh, and then once you have that, I'm, I'm gonna remove this because it's not, <laughs> I'm not, I don't have server running right now. So, and I haven't been testing it, but, uh, but I mean, the, the other thing one might to do, one might want to do then is that you have a master database that it's being curated together and you don't want to be adding your stuff in that database because that would uh, kind of a mess things up. Then what you can do is to make your own, um, uh, own additional database where you you may play around with stuff and um, uh, maybe you do it local um, and I'm just creating that database now and uh, I can add here things here as well so I can add um, what was it called now power plant if I remember right and then I will add an the same or object plant A. Probably gonna mess something up, but let's let's try. And then I'm gonna make a, that capacity parameter here as well. I, I mean I could copy these from the other database. I'm maybe doing this bit stupid because I might write something wrong and then it won't work so well. Um, but then I will. Uh, have that plant A here now, and I take the capacity parameter, and uh, I'm I'm gonna do my own um, new alternative. So I can pick that new one, and and put a value that's something different than there was before. And so I'm gonna create my own alternatives. Uh, on my own database that the others don't need to see. And then I can, um, I can take and combine data coming from both of these databases. And uh, maybe I want to have a middle step where they, I can see them together, but in principle, this should also work that I can uh, see the scenarios, but I didn't actually establish those scenarios here yet. I just made the alternative, so I should make a scenario called new, where I drag the base and the new, oops, didn't do that properly. And then, uh, then I should be able to see that new scenario and I should be able to combine stuff also from the two different databases to, so that I don't, I keep the common database clean and just do my edits on a separate one. Well, well thank you. Uh, you also talked about the fact that it, we must be, you must be careful when you're adding new, importing new data, uh, mm. like you're adding an additional set of data and then you delete the, the previous one. But is there a uh, is there a way to put uh, uh, all those data under some sort of version control mechanism? And is it already there in the system, or it's not there right now? So I hope we can get this. Uh, this is a bit of a, my plan, <laughs> so I need to get also other paws into this idea. But I'm I'm thinking that we should we have these alternatives, and I think we could expand this in a way where they could have a history. So when I run this import, um, you, you will see that the, once it's done, it's a bit taking a bit of time, okay. So I refresh this and I, I have this alternative that has in the end all the timestamps. So I, I, I would like to take this part here and make it an, a new dimension 
function underneath this import data. And then maybe, maybe the base could have versions that also contain the history of the base if you want to keep it. I mean, I think we need to be able to allow the user to also not keep it, especially when it comes to those long time series that take a lot of, uh, lot of space. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that would be something to, to have in the future. Yeah, thank you. But could it be like in parallel, not necessarily integrated into the tool, but at least mm -hmm. be able to save all the data files? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can always, you can, you can take a duplicate of this database mm -hmm. and then store it somewhere. Or I mean, it's, in this case, it's just a file, so you can just do a copy in the file system as well, or have a version control in your file system. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, one more question. Any plans to develop the option to export databases in other format than either than uh, SQL Lite or MySQL, Paste SQL? Um, so po PostgreSQL is something we've been discussing that we would like to support as a, as a database in the Spine toolbox. Um, I mean, the, I don't know the export there because mainly if you want to export from here, you would probably export it in uh, in an Excel file or something. And that we are building right now an exporter, a generic exporter for uh, the similar, we have the importer, we would also have an exporter. Right now we have only a GDX exporter and we want to expand that to be able to do all kinds of file formats. And of course, then when you are, if you want to take this data and turn it into a new SQL database that could uh, have a totally different table structure, then um, that's not there at the moment. But I, I, I mean, I think that should be pretty feasible, um, like uh, a bit similar to imp exporting to Excel sheets you would be exporting to uh, SQL uh, tables. Um, I think that should be possible to build. I don't know whether we're going to manage that in the project or not. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for uh, one or two more questions. I will ask one of them um, if no one else has questions. Uh, I think you said that the project is still, you still have nine months to go into the project, mm. correct? And what's yep. the um, what's the um, what's the, the, the what are you planning for after those nine months? What will, what will happen with the project after those nine months? Well, we are certainly. I mean, the project partners are going to be using the system, and and we have some small. We have some other projects that are going to be using this, and and uh, probably we can do some development there as well. But it's really for those projects are really for using. So uh, it's always not, it's much less, much less resource than we have in this prime project itself to be developing. Um, I think I did, maybe didn't mention, oh my AI yeah, was in my, my slides. We have the trade dress EU project that has a, uh, is gonna be using this for running optimization models and agent based models for exploring market design. And, uh, and as we are trying to set up uh, this toolbox for that process, we probably need to be doing some work on the coding side as well uh, to serve that. And, and that's one resource, but I'm really looking for new projects that would have a bigger resource for uh, supporting. supporting. So that's something uh, we try to work on. And since it's open source, uh, I guess anyone that would we be willing to uh, contribute to that project would be willing yeah. to do so, right? Yeah. And yeah. You said yeah. that there is a private and a public uh, repository right now. What's the what's the distinction between the two, and will the private be made public at some point? Yeah, uh, basically, yeah, yeah. We just uh, it's going to be in two weeks or so that it's oh. going to be turned into public one. I mean, and the only big difference is that the issues. Uh, so if I go here to spine, uh, this is now the private one. And I go to the issues where we discuss uh, what needs to be improved. 
and and assign tasks to people and so forth. Uh, and this, uh, so this is not visible at the moment. Okay, thank you. Well, um, if there is no more question, uh, um, I will uh, thank you, Juha. Thank you for that. Um, and I will invite people to, uh, let me just uh, take back so, control of the screen. And I will invite you people to um, register for our upcoming webinars if those are, are, uh, are of interest to you. Uh, the one on February 9 we'll talk about this big uh, modeling exercise where they're uh, They've been uh, trying to um, uh, model the uh, or take into consideration financial risks and the impact that uh, climate changes will have on, on some of the uh, some investments, mostly in the uh, energy sector. And another webinar that's already confirmed, it, it is the one on February 11th, where we'll, we're not going to talk that much about modeling, but more on the data acquisition process, which, uh, as you must all know, is always an issue that is raised when we're talking about uh, modeling. Um, so that one should be also quite interesting. So with that being said, I will thank you all. Uh, and I will remind you to stay safe and be careful. Thank you very much.